Good evening. Good evening. Oh, we can do better than that. Good evening. Good evening. All right. It's a blessing to see each and every one of you. A word of prayer. Our Father and our God in heaven, we're thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from all sin. And Lord, we're thankful that Jesus came to this wicked earth and laid down his life, gave his life as a ransom for many, that we might have freedom from sin and also that we might have eternal life. Lord, this evening as we have gathered to once again study and to look deeper into the words that you have given to each and every one of us, Lord, I ask and pray that you would arrest our attention, that the Holy Spirit would be present and be poured out in this place, that you would speak to each and every individual heart, Lord, that these words would not be my own, but that they would be yours and that they would bring, bring healing, hope, and also, Lord, conviction and conversion upon your people today. Bless us, Lord. May your spirit dwell with this is our prayer. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. This evening I want to just look at a... We got something in the Word of God. In fact, I um, want to share with you some things. You know, we're living in some solemn times, um, as most of you know. The different things that are taking place and happening in the world are all indications that Christ's coming is very, very near. Um, and as this year rolled around uh, in Porterville, where we have a... Uh, a group where we're worshiping there together. We looked at the things that are taking place in the earth and what's going to happen. And we decided that something needed to be done. We know this year is the 500th year anniversary of Martin Luther and the 95 thesis that he nailed uh, to the castle there in Wittenberg. And so we also recognize that this is the year that the Pope is declaring the end of the Protestant Reformation. And so as we contemplated that, as we studied that, because we, since the beginning of the year, we've been studying through the book, Great Controversy. We said, listen, we need to get this book in the hands of the people. And so we covenanted uh, with the Lord that we wanted to get at least 5,000 books, Great Controversies, out to the community. And so uh, we began our journey and uh, we put together a religious liberty survey uh, that we've been going door to door with. And as we've been knocking on the doors, we've been asking the different questions, um, you know, on this particular survey and people, uh, the majority of people don't know the answers to the questions. And so at the end of the survey, we say, well, here's a book that will help you uh, answer those questions. Amen. And we've been putting the books in the hands of the people. And that's uh, a lot of people have been receiving the books. A lot of people have been taking the books. And, you know, that's just one of the miracles. In fact, somebody last night as I was conducting prayer meeting um, at a church in Central California, they were telling me that they had taken uh, the survey to their church and they had gone out in the community. And just this past Sabbath, they had gotten two Bible studies just off the survey. Amen. People asked for uh, Bible studies going through the survey and they wanted the book uh, Great Controversy. Uh, the Lord also blessed us to be able to get the book Great Controversy for a very wonderful price. Um, that's a good thing, amen? amen. I mean, I, I, I'm not blessed with the talent or the, the talent of money. So, you know, it's always good when you get something um, 
you know, practically for nothing. And we were able to get the books for 50 cents a piece. Uh, we were able to purchase these books and uh, the Lord has just been helping us uh, with this. And as I've been in contact um, with different ones, because actually the the avenue that I was able to get the books was uh, the GLOW department um, in the Central California Conference. Many of you have maybe seen the GLOW tracks and uh, the Central California Conference is where they actually, their, their department is. It's where they're, they're out of. And so I went and got the books from the lady there and, and she asked, why do you need so many books? And so I told her what we were doing. And she said, why aren't all of our churches doing this? Why aren't we getting this book out? Because the spirit of prophecy says the time is coming when we're not going to be able to work and we need to get these books out as, as much as possible. But she said something else and she said, you know what, it's very interesting that you're, you're saying this and that you guys are doing this because we just produced a track that deals exactly what you're doing, uh, deals exactly with what you guys are dealing with. And I said, really? And so she handed me a little track and it's called Unity. Is Unity Greater Than Truth? And what this tract is about, it's about the Protestant Reformation. And it's about uh, how it was based on the Bible and the Bible only and how the Pope is trying to gather all of these religions together. And should we stand, should we just unify based upon unity or should we hold to the truth? And it came, she said, we just printed these. God must have knew that you guys must have needed these things. And so uh, I believe I do have some with me. I believe I do. And so we were thankful to be able to get those tracks to pass out as well. Um, the Lord is opening up many doors and this message is being able to get to many places, uh, which is evidence that God, as we've been told in the pen of inspiration, is taking the work into his own hands. And that's a blessing, brothers and sisters, because this message needs to go everywhere. Um, today, I want to share something with you that uh, as I've been studying through the book of ministry, the ministry of healing, I believe it applies uh, to all of us because we we've, we've been told it applies to all of us. Uh, but I want to look at this particular chapter in the book of ministry of healing. Now, I'm going to take it uh, apart and we're going to study this over the next few days. Uh, but I want us to turn our attention to the book of Revelation chapter two. Let's go there. Let's go to Revelation chapter two. We're going to study some things uh, by God's grace over the next few days together. Um, dealing with something that is vital to our salvation. I would say it's most vital, uh, something that we desperately need. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to begin in verse number 8, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 8, and when you get there, amen. amen. Or when you get there, just let me know. Uh, it says this. Notice what it says. It says, and unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things saith the first and the last. It says, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. But what is the promise, brothers and sisters? Be thou what? Faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. God, what is he requiring of his people as they pass through great tribulation? He's requiring what? Faithfulness, right? Being faithful unto death. And we're going to look at that uh, for a little bit today. But let's turn in our Bibles to another text to deal with this particular point. To 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's notice what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Be thou faithful unto death is the promise and I will give thee a crown of life. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2, it says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found what? Faithful. Faithful. 
we see that God is asking us to be faithful unto death, that we would receive the crown of life. The Bible tells us that if we are stewards, that one thing that needs to be found in stewards is that we be found what? Faithful. That we be found faithful. Now, it's very interesting because Christ asked a question. He asked a question, and then we find that question in the book of Luke chapter 18. Let's go there to Luke chapter 18. We see that God is asking us to be faithful unto death, and we will receive the crown of life. We see that God is telling us that we, as we're faithful or as we're stewards, we need to be found faithful being his stewards. Luke chapter 18, Christ tells a parable here. And we all maybe have read this parable, maybe not, but for those who have not and for those who may be watching, it says, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to do what? Pray and not to faint, saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded men. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Now I want you to keep this parable in your minds, because we're going to come back and revisit this at the end of our presentation. Notice what it says. And he said, and the Lord said, excuse me, hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with him? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find what? Faith. We see that God is asking his people to be faithful unto death. We see that God is requiring us as stewards to be faithful. And Jesus is telling us here that when he comes back, what is he looking for? Faith. Will I find faithful people on the earth? We're going to look at what faith Jesus is looking for. What is, he, what is he looking for when he comes back? What faith is he looking for? But before we answer that question, the Bible says, we read earlier, that God asked us as his people to be faithful unto death. And the promise was what? you will receive a crown of life. How is it that we're faithful unto death that we might be able to receive a crown of life? I want you to turn with me in your Bible to the book of James. James chapter 1. How is it that we, as God's people, are to be faithful unto death that we might be able to receive the crown of life that God has for us? Notice what it says in James chapter 1, beginning with verse number 12. James chapter 1 and verse 12. And when you get there, let me know. Amen. The Bible tells us here, James chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man that does what? Endure temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the what? Crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So notice, Revelation chapter 2 said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. How is it that we're faithful unto death? According to James chapter 1 and verse 12. What must we do? We must endure temptation. Because the Bible says when we endure temptation, blessed is the man that endure temptation for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. If we are Faithful. How, how, how are we faithful? It's by enduring temptation. By enduring temptation through great trials and tribulations. This is how we demonstrate our faithfulness to God. Notice what it says in that same chapter, just a few verses up, beginning with verse number two. It says, my brethren, count it all what? Count it all what? Joy when you fall into what? Diverse temptations. Diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that she may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. 
God is telling us in his word that he desires us as we go through this trying process to allow this trying process to be faithful as we endure this trying process, to endure it, to not give up, to not give in to temptations. This is what the word of God is telling us. And God has promised us a crown of life if we make it through this trying process. God has promised to perfect us as we go through this trying process, if we endure it. It's very interesting because the Bible says, let patience or knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Is there anybody in the Bible that is required or is said to have patience? Job, the saints. Also Job. The Bible says here, Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The patience of the saints. How are the saints' patience? What have they done? They've endured temptation. They have been faithful unto death. This is how they receive the crown of life that God has for them. How do we endure temptation, though? How is it that we endure temptation? Let me ask that question. Let's, let's, let's look at an individual. In fact, I heard it earlier. The Bible talks about the patience of Job, right? Let me, let me just ask this question. How did Job endure temptation? Does anybody know? He stayed faithful to God. He stayed faithful to God? Let's, let's, let's turn to the book of Job. Let's look at this really quickly. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. And then we're, we're going to come back to the book of Hebrews. How did Job remain faithful? Did Job endure great uh, trials, yes. tribulation? Yes. Oh, yes. What happened to Job? Everything, Everything was taken from him. Yes. His children, his health, his possessions, they were all gone. But notice what it says here in Job chapter 1. And let's look at verse 20. Job chapter 1 and verse 20, because the Bible talks about the patience of Job, how Job endured. Notice what it says. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground. And what did Job do? Worshiped. He worshiped and said, naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse 22. In all this what does the Bible say? Job Nor charge God foolishly. So Job did not sin. As Job went through the trial, as he went through these temptations, as he went and endured all of these things that came upon him, the Bible tells us that he did not sin. That he did not speak foolishly with his mouth against the Lord. This is how Job endured. This is how Job made it through. This is the patience of Job. Now, turn with me in your Bibles because I asked the question, how is it that we endure temptation? Notice what your Bible says in the book of Hebrews. How is it that we endure temptation according to the scriptures? I want you to notice that the Bible gives us another example of enduring temptation or enduring trials and tribulations. Hebrews chapter 6. We're looking at another example here. Hebrews chapter 6. Are we together? Amen. Okay, notice what it says. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 13. It says, for when God made what? Okay, I still hear some pages turning. It says, for when God made promise to who? Abraham. Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swear, swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had, what, brothers and sisters? Patiently endured, he obtained the what? He obtained the promise. How was it that, how, how was it that 
Abraham was able to endure? How was it that he was able to patiently endure? What had God done to Abraham? He made him a promise. How is it that we as God's people are going to endure? How is it that we're going to endure? Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's look at verse number four. We know this. We'll begin in verse number three. Second Peter chapter one, beginning with verse number three. Notice what the Bible says. It says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The Bible tells us that God has given us promise whereby we are to endure temptation, and this is how we may receive the crown of life that God has for us. As we began our study, we were talking about faith and how God is looking for faith. Why do we need faith? The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, because without faith, it is what? Impossible. It's impossible to please God. It's impossible to please God because if we come to God, we number one must believe that he is. What does that mean? He is God. Okay. But he is, when we say is, what is is? It's a verb, right? Is it not? Is is a verb. So we must believe that God is. Is And it's a present verb. It means that God is living. He's there. He's with us. Faith has to believe that God is among us, that he's with us, that he will give us power. Notice as we continue to read Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, that God is and that he is a rewarder of them that do what? Diligently what? Are we seeking God? Because if we're seeking after God, the Bible tells us, what will God do for us? He will reward us. I'm going to come back to that. The Bible tells us, turn with me in, the, in your Bible to the book of Numbers. Let's turn to the book of Numbers. I told you there's something that God's people are lacking today. And we're going to look at what that is. Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. Why do we need faith? Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, we cannot overcome. Without faith, in fact, as we're going to see here, we're going to see what happens when we don't have faith, when we don't believe. Notice Numbers chapter 14, and let's look at verse number 11. Notice what it says. Numbers 14 and verse 11. The Bible says, and the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people do what? Provoke me. Well, what do you mean? How is it that we provoke God? It says, and how long will it be ere they, what does it say? Believe me for all the signs which I have shown among them. So how is it that we provoke God? How do we provoke God? By not believing. By not by not having faith, this causes God to be provoked. And we're going to see why. Turn with me to the 20th chapter of the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 20. And we're going to look at verse number 12. So what happens when we don't believe? God is provoked. 
Notice what it goes to, goes on to say in Numbers chapter 20, and we're looking at verse number 12. Numbers chapter 20 and verse number 12. The Bible says, and the Lord spake unto who? Moses and Aaron, because ye believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. So what does unbelief cause to happen, brothers and sisters? You cannot enter into the promised land because of unbelief. Unbelief provokes God, and unbelief, it bars our way from entering into God's kingdom. Now you may say, well, yes, we understand that. We know that. Let's continue to read. Let's continue to study. T turn with me to Psalm chapter 78. Psalm chapter 78. Notice what it says in Psalms 78. The Bible tells us, be thou faithful unto death. I will give thee a crown of life. The Bible told us, when the Son of Man cometh back, will he find faith on the earth? We're in Psalm 78, and we're going to begin in verse 21. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, we provoke God. Without faith, we don't get to enter into the kingdom of God. Notice what it says here, Psalm 78 and verse 21, it says, Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth, so a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came upon Israel. Because, what brothers and sisters? They believed not in God, and what? Trusted not in his salvation, Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them the corn of heaven. So wait a minute. You mean to tell me that it is possible for us to be receiving the blessings of God and still not believe in God? Is that possible? Yes. Yes. It's possible for us to be partaking of the manna of heaven, the angel's food, the word of truth, and still not believe in Christ, still not have faith in him and his power to save. It's possible because we see it here demonstrated in the experience of the children of Israel. Now, I asked the question earlier, and I'll ask it again. What, what faith is Christ looking for when he comes back? What is the faith that he's looking for? Faith of Jesus. Faith of Jesus we read in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 12 that here are the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The Bible tells us in the book of Jude, chapter 1. Let's all turn there to Jude, right before Revelation, Jude, chapter 1, and verse number 3. What faith is Jesus looking for when he comes back? The faith of Jesus. I would also say faith in Jesus, as we will see in a few moments. But notice what it says, Jude, chapter 1, and verse number 3. It says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. God, when he comes back, he's looking for a people who are contending for the faith that was delivered unto the saints the old path, the good way, who are standing upon the solid rock, Jesus Christ. God is looking for people that are holding on to the first, second, and third angel's messages and who are standing on those messages. This is the faith that God is looking for when he comes back. But is that all? Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians the third chapter. Beginning with verse number 8. Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 8. Are we all there? All right. 
It says, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by what? So what faith is Jesus looking for? He's looking for the righteousness which is by faith. Notice what it goes on to say in verse number 10. That I may what? Know him. Know him. And knowing God is what, brothers and sisters? Eternal life. Eternal life. So righteousness by faith, having that experience, not having our own righteousness, but having his righteousness is knowing him. This is what it means to know Jesus Christ. And it goes on to say, it says, and the power of his res resurrection. You see, when you have experienced righteousness by faith in your own experience, you have experienced the power of the resurrection. Amen. How many of you know what it is to feel like to be dead and come back to life? Amen. How many of you have had that experience? All of us in here should have that experience. Amen. We were lost, but now we're found. The Bible tells us this is what it means to experience righteousness by faith, that we may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Verse number 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. You see, in order to be raised, to be able to receive that crown of life, if we do pass away, we must experience the righteousness of God, which is by faith. This is the faith that Christ is coming and he's looking for. But I want to look at a story in the Bible with you. I told you that I was basing this on a chapter in the book, The Ministry of Healing. I want to look at the book of, let's turn to the book of Mark, chapter 5. Mark, chapter 5. One of the things that is lacking today in the church that is vital for the health of God's people is faith. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. You may say, well, no. We have faith, but let me, let, me, let, me, let me say this to you. There are many people that Jesus healed while he was on earth, but there were certain people that he went out of his way after he had healed them to exclaim something about them and about their faith. All of these individuals were not Jews. And what would he say about their faith? He would say, I have not found so great a faith, not in all of Israel. What is that? What was he saying? I have not found a faith, not in all of the Seventh-day Adventist church. In other words, there are those on the outside that have more faith in God than we in the church do. You didn't like that, did you? There are people in the world that have greater faith than you and I. That's what Jesus was telling the Jews in that time. And are we following in the footsteps of ancient Israel? Yep. Yes, we are. So that must mean that faith is lacking today. I want to look at this story here with you as we read. We'll pick it up in verse number 25, Mark chapter 5 and verse 25. The Bible says, and a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better, but rather grew what? Worse. This woman was sick for 12 years, spent all of her money 
and she didn't get better, she got worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be what? Whole. Verse 29. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. The Bible goes on to say, And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? Now I want to stop there. This woman, as we will find out just very shortly in the spirit of prophecy, Sister White says that she had been following Jesus. She was following him. She was following him, brothers and sisters. She had exhausted all of her means. There was nothing else for her to do. And she said, listen, I've heard of him. I've heard that he has healed people. Let me go after him. Let me... I believe that if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I can be healed. And she touched him. She touched the hem of his garment. And the Bible says that she knew she was healed. Now, Jesus turns around and he says, he asked the question, what? Who touched me? Who touched me? Verse 31 says, And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? Now think about this, brothers and sisters. Jesus is in the midst of a multitude of people. People are touching him all around. But let me ask you a question. Those people that were in the presence of Jesus, touching him all around, were they healed? No. No. Why weren't they healed? Because they did not believe. They didn't have faith. Here was one person in a multitude who believed. And as she touched the garment of Christ, she was healed. Brothers and sisters, isn't that the condition of God's people today? We have many people in churches. We have many people praising God and talking about God, but nobody's healed. Nobody has been freed from their condition. Nobody has been changed. Why? Why, brothers and sisters? It's because, is it because God doesn't have the power? Why is it? Because we lack the faith. Because we do not believe. It goes on to say that Jesus, verse 32, and he looked around, round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her daughter, what? Thy faith hath made thee whole. Now what does he tell her to do? Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Christ tells her, listen, it, it was your faith that healed you. It was because you believed in my power to save that you were healed. How many of us today need that power? Amen. I mean, we need it. And I'm not talking about just from the physical maladies that we may be suffering from, but what about those sins that constantly plague us, brothers and sisters? And we find ourselves constantly falling over and over and in, uh, again into. Jesus says, have faith. Believe. And I can make you whole. Now, there was something else going on at this time. Turn with me back in your Bibles, or turn with me to the book of Luke. Because if you remember, if you remember reading through this story, there was, Jesus was actually headed to someone's house. He was heading to someone's house to heal his daughter. 
That's right. Going to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 and verse 49. Notice what it says in Luke chapter 8 and verse 49. It says, while he, was, while he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, Thy daughter is dead, trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying what? Fear not. What does he say? Believe only and what? She shall be made whole. Have you ever been faced with a situation that seems like somebody just died? Death? What did Jesus say to the man? Fear not. What else? Believe only. And it says, and she shall be made whole. Why are we so unfaithful to God? Why don't we believe? Why don't we believe in his power to save and, and to transform and to convert our lives and our hearts and our minds? What is it that is causing us to continue to wallow in the mire of sin and doubt? I want to read something to you as we begin to wind this down. It says, on his way, I'm reading from the book Desire of Ages 343. It says, on the way to the ruler's house, Jesus had met in the crowd a poor woman who for 12 years had suffered from a disease that made her life a burden. She had spent all her means upon physicians and remedies only to be pronounced incurable. But her hopes revived when she heard of the cures that Christ performed. She felt assured that if she could only go to him, she would be healed. In weakness and suffering, she came to the seaside where he was teaching and tried to press through the crowd, but in vain. Again, she followed him to the house of Levi Matthew, but was unable to reach him. She had begun to despair when in making his way through the multitude, he came near where she was. What do we see about this lady? What do we notice about her? Persistence. She continued to press towards Christ. Even though things look hopeless, she continued to press. She followed him. She wasn't able to get him here, not there, but she continued to go. Who does this remind us of? As we, we talked about earlier. The woman, the unjust judge. She continued to weary him day and night. Notice what it goes on to say. It says, the golden opportunity had come. She was in the presence of the great physician, but amid the confusion, she could not speak to him nor catch more than a passing glimpse of his figure. Fearful of losing her one chance of relief, she pressed forward saying to herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. As he was passing, she reached forward and succeeded in barely touching the border of his garment. But in that moment, she knew that she was healed. Now notice what this says. In that one touch, was concentrated the faith of her life. Everything that was in her grasped a hold of Christ. She believed. And what happened, brothers and sisters? Immediately, she knew she was healed. Now, this was an internal disease. Could she see within herself? Did she have x-rays? I mean, how does she know? She had faith. She believed. It goes on to say, 
In that one touch was concentrated the faith of her life and instantly her pain and feebleness gave place to vigor, to the vigor of perfect health. Skipping down of page 347, Desire of Ages, it says this, the wondering crowd that pressed close about Christ realized no ascension of vital power. But when the suffering woman put forth her hand to touch him, believing that she would be made whole, she felt the healing virtue. Did you catch it? The crowd around Christ, they felt no vital power. But when this woman put forth her hand to touch him, believing that she would be made whole, she felt the healing power because she believed. Notice what she says. So in spiritual things. So as in the natural, so in the what? Spiritual. spiritual. This is where we're going here. She believed God. All her faith was in him. She grasped hold. She believed in what Christ was able to do for her. And it was done. It says here, so in the spiritual. To talk of religion in a casual way. To pray without soul hunger and living faith avails nothing. Have mercy. The reason why I say have mercy, brothers and sisters, is because many times I'm guilty of praying without a soul hunger. When we, when we pray, is, is our soul hungering for Jesus and his power? It says, it will avail nothing. A nominal faith in Christ, which accepts him merely as the savior of the world, can never bring healing to the soul. The faith that is, to, that, the faith that is unto salvation is not a mere intellectual assent to the truth. He who waits for an entire knowledge before he will exercise faith cannot receive blessing from God. It is not enough to believe about Christ. We must believe in Christ, in him. It says the only faith that will benefit us is that which embraces him as a personal savior, which appropriates his merits to ourselves. Many hold faith as an opinion. What does she say? As a what? An, an opinion. It says saving faith is a transaction by which those who receive Christ join themselves in a covenant relation with God. What kind of faith do we have today? Is our faith merely and based upon an intellectual knowledge? Is our faith merely an opinion or is our faith a living faith that is a trans transaction with God. Finally, it says here, genuine faith is life. A living faith means an increase of vigor, a confiding trust by which the soul becomes a conquering power. How many of us desire to be a conquering power? Amen. We have to have a living faith, brothers and sisters. A faith that doesn't just believe about Christ, but believes in Christ. A faith that doesn't just believe that I just need to gain all this information, but that my belief in Christ causes me to have a transaction with him to accept his righteousness, even though I am filthy, to accept his forgiveness, even though I'm the chief of sinners. We must believe in God's power to save if we're to experience that power in our own Christian experience. Christ asked the question, I ask again, when the Son of Man comes back, will he find faith? 
Will he find faith, brothers and sisters? Will he find that living faith in you and I? This is what Jesus is looking for when he comes again. Let us bow our heads as we pray. Father in heaven, as we look at the life of this woman, Lord, she had tried to find healing for 12 years in all the wrong places. She had expended all of her money and she didn't get better, she got worse. And Lord, this woman is a symbol of your people today. Many of us are trying to find the cure for the sickness of sin that many of us have in many different places. You have many people today who are even among your people who are in love with truth, who are in love with the doctrines of Christ, but not are in love with Christ himself. Not in love with Jesus the one who came to save them. Many people that think we can find salvation in those things. But Lord, you have called us to have a living faith. A faith that believes in your power to do and believes in your word to do exactly what it says it will do. Father, we desire to have that experience tonight to believe, Lord, in your word and in the promises that you have given to us. We read tonight that you have given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. Lord, you have given us access to your nature. All we need to do is believe and claim these promises and fulfill those conditions, Lord, that you might live within our hearts. Father, as we continue to fellowship one with another, I pray that our conversation would be such that it would uplift, that it would encourage and inspire hope in those who need hope, those who need to be encouraged and have their faith renewed, or those who need to be strengthened that they might continue to run the race because, Lord, things are wrapping up. And, Father, we need to be faithful. We need to be found faithful in you. We thank you for uh, this time of study, and we just continue to ask and pray that you would be with us. Bless us with your spirit. May um, this time, Lord, be special to us as your people. For these things we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.